Uh, hi there, I thought uh, some of you might be interested in having a look over some of the modification and enhancements and improvements I've been making to my Celestron Nexstar 127. It's already a pretty good little scope, but uh, there's always room for improvement, so let me talk you over what the things I've been doing to it. Um, the first thing you'll notice, of course, is this nice, big, sturdy tripod. The uh, tripod it comes with is not bad, but it's, it, it's a little bit flimsy, so if you're not transferring it very far, like I don't, I think it's worth the payback of weight versus stability. So, I knocked this up with some uh, bits and pieces in my workshop. Um, the mounting, let's go around here, the circular mounting, it lends itself ideally to this sort of construction because you can just cut a circular hole in a top plate and use the oops can't see use the uh, original screw to mount it like so. The hinges are just bog standard door hinges uh, and it improves the stability no end. Okay, oh and there's a I made a a nice simple tray for with some lens holes in nice and rudimentary this clips out of place with some door bolts very basic oh, and this gizmo here is just a clamp so that I can wrap the legs together when they're folded away uh, the little handle is just a transportation okay right the next um, lost my thread a bit there Right, the next thing we'd like to look at is the handset. Um, the original curly lead is somewhat on the short side, so I've extended it with some uh, networking cable. I think it's four or five core cable. Uh, if you're prepared to take the back off it, if my memory serves me right, the original cable is just held in with a, a, um, oh, so, um, a plug, a five pin plug. I cut that and attach the new wire and go around to the socketry end of it over here and I was able to crimp on a new uh, RJ, RJ45 connector. Uh, I usefully got hold of a RJ crimping tool off eBay which wasn't very expensive, five or six pounds if that, maybe even less, but made the job a lot easier. Okay, right, next uh, improvement, batteries. The original unit is of course powered by dry cells. You can get a power adapter but it's quite expensive and of course you're stuck with the mains. So I had a few motorcycle batteries kicking about that were well past their sell-by date. Um, even though they won't power a motorcycle, they're I they're still plenty of oomph, 12 volts in there to power up the telescope. The uh, socketry is um, what do you, um, oh, I forgot what you call it, phone, we call them phono sockets or I think it's RCA sockets which I chose because of their relatively large surface area. Oh, excuse me Mr Seagull. Okay, and the next thing we look at is, oh yes, I also, there's nothing worse than when you're doing a, having an observing session, kicking the power supply out and losing all your, your uh, alignment so I've just added here a little clip so that it wraps around there if you kick it it's not going to yank out of the socket. You've probably noticed uh, all over the telescope some extra bits and pieces of wood and metal. These is just some uh, bracing to try and stop the whole uh, tube flexing laterally which even though it's a fairly sturdy mount still does uh, I'd made with, tried to do it with minimum intrusion, so I've picked up on the original screws and, and bolts and just made it, cut the bits of uh, uh, wood and metal to suit and to bring out a rod or post to this point here, which is the axis of the tube. I found this by uh, placing, holding a pen, a pencil uh, in place and rotating the tube up and down until I centred in on exactly where that point was. I then mounted a nylon bolt on some sticky back plastic so that bolt there, you can just see, that nut, sorry, uh, 
is stuck to the sticky back plastic and doesn't impinge on the tube. Um, so if I just unscrew this screw here, take it right out, the tube can still be slid out and if necessary the sticky back plastic can be removed, leaving no damage or mark on the, uh, on the telescope. Uh, right, what do we go around to now? Uh, one of my favourite modifications is this setup here. Uh, it's a motor focus cobbled together again out of bits and pieces. The motor is a geared, a low geared motor from eBay for about six dollars, six pounds, something like that. The cogs are out of an old printer. Uh, and this here is just a press. I hollowed out the centre, it's just a press fit onto the rubber tube. Um, so there's no in, in damage there. And if I can demonstrate it, oh, sorry, the power is supplied from this box of tricks here. Switch it on, there's a 9 volt battery in there, and also a pulse width modulator control so that the speed of the motor can be adjusted. You probably can't see it there, but there's a rear stat, so you can turn the speed up and down if you find it's motor focusing too fast. Um, it does contain also two relays which were required to... Uh, I couldn't figure out a way of changing the polarity to go forward and back. Anyway, the wire, there's a wire from this control unit all the way out to the handset, which you can just see here. It's the second, the white wire in. And I just turn this over a little bit. And this is a, the controller, the, sorry, the switch. So I don't know if you can hear that, the motor's running. If we go around to the motor, we go one direction and the other direction. And that is marvellous. You stop you be touching the telescope at all, and of course then there's no um, cut, what is it, settle down period after you've uh, focused. So that's really splendid. Um, what, what do we have next? Um, uh, right, I'll talk about the uh, laser pointer I think next. I quite like to see where I'm looking in the sky even um, rather than using the finder scope, so I mounted a laser pointer which are available quite cheaply now. I've just clamped it into a groove on the dovetail so it's pointing exactly in alignment with the telescope tube. The switch is just mounted off, mount on a bit of velcro here, can't see it, it's daylight, but it press and points to the area in the sky you're looking at. Again, very helpful. Um, and what else? Oh, oops, sorry. And, okay, as you can see, I like using binocular viewer. A binocular viewer. This is very heavy. Um, so to combat uh, this slipping around, I've spoiled myself with one of these Denkmeyer uh, 90 degree visual backs. Don't strictly need it to be a two inch one because I think you'll get vignetting at the side. Uh, at, the, at the edges of the image, it won't actually the oh, the focal length that you won't allow it to use it. But with the one point one and a quarter inch eyepieces, it's fine. The main reason I bought it was to take the weight of the um, bino viewer. And if I just pop the camera on a tripod a minute, and I can hopefully demonstrate how it works. If you bear with me, just two seconds. Talk amongst yourselves while I'm uh, it. I can't figure out how to ah, get in there. Okay, that's firm. Right. Okay. Um, okay. So the main the main trick of this is the fact of this corrugated clamping affair. Now, if I unscrew it, you'll see that it comes off and. It's actually conically, it's a conical shape. And also you can see the serrated collar that engages in teeth on the mounting. So even if it's mounted at a quite a steep angle, I hope this doesn't fall flop now, you engage the teeth, just lock it off, and so long as your adapter here to the actual scope is really firm, it ain't gonna budge no, no matter what. The only downside of it, the the is quite expensive, and also you need 
an adapter specific to a Celestron tube. Um, and I think it's also common to all, all these 127 tubes. For some reason, they've chosen a non-standard <coughs> excuse me, thread. So you have to get a, an adapter for the specific to the Celestron to an SCT back. And I've, I think I got mine from a company. I call, think they were called Blue Fireball or something like that. But it's about twenty twenty dollars something like that from the states. Uh, but uh, it's the only way you can do it. Um, right, what else? Oh, what else have we got? Um, I've also made an adapter for the. For, ooh, oops. Camera's, camera's falling out of the tripod. Um, okay, and if I just. I've made a. Sorry, I've lost my thread again. I've made a camera uh, mounting plate, which I think is in the garage. So, But I made it to fit in the finder scope mount. I'll just go and grab it from the garage. Et voilà, a uh, adapter plate. This prong sticks into there, and also the rubber buffer at the front here gives it a very stable mount on the scope tube and so so and the camera of course fits in there and of course then you've now got a nice tracking mount and the last thing I did I was required to align I needed to align the telescope in the daytime a while ago to observe uh, Venus dangerous thing to align once you've selected the sun from the the uh, menu of celestial objects you really don't want to go looking at the sun as everybody always advises you so i made up a daylight alignment tool which is effectively just a sundial it's like so a piece of angled aluminium a screen at the back with a uh, an outline of a front peg so when you get the when you want to align the daylight, you make sure the shadow of the front peg falls completely within the um, confines of the uh, of the template. Pop it on the, just lift, just lay it on the tube, and uh, line it up. It worked very successfully. Got a successful alignment the first time around. Well, I'm sure there are a load of other things that I could have talked about. Um, for now, I forget what they are, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you for watching.